I don't care what you believe in, but on earth, it's a very lonely journey. And it starts with the accountability mirror, looking at saying, hey, my daddy beat the hell out of me, he's not coming back. All these things are coming back. I have to face myself. Every person you look up to, their success story can be your story using this three-step process. The table is always full of excuses because they're valid. Rise and shine, it's espresso time. <laughs> I wake up every morning. Espresso, keep me going. I wake up every morning. So let's start your day off right together. Grab your coffee and sip on today's message from David Goggins. Also, if you want to learn how to have more confidence, check out my 254 Confidence series. It's free. The link to join is in the description below. You will never learn from people if we always tap dance around the truth. Everything yeah. I didn't want to do is what got me to where I'm at today. So one big thing is the accountability mirror. Mm, you have that. to start with yourself. So what happened in, in my life was we start to get, I call it like the rucksack. A rucksack is a pack that you carry in the military and you put all your stuff in it, your radios, your food, your water, all that stuff you have to carry in the military. That's your rucksack. It's a backpack, pretty much. As you're growing up, we all have a backpack. Most of ours, hopefully, is empty, you know, and what we put in it is all the crap we go through in life. That's what is in the backpack for the civilians, and we carry it around with us. So what you have to start doing is realizing that no matter where you're at in life, I got called nigger a lot. My dad abused me, you know, learning disability, stutters, immaturity, insecurities, self-doubt, so much crap on top of me. So much stuff. I lied a lot to create friends. So people, were, so much stuff was in my backpack. No one's coming back to help me. So it starts with that person in that mirror. You have to realize you are on your own now. And whatever else you believe in, I don't care what you believe in, but on earth, it's a very lonely journey. And it starts with the accountability mirror of looking at saying, hey, my dad who beat the hell out of me is not coming back. All these things are coming back. I have to face myself. And you have to own all those things that people may have done to you. Now it's yours. You got to own it. And it's yours now to fix the problems that people did to you. It makes no sense. It's not fair. I get it. But if you live in that what was me mentality of guess what? My dad did this to me. My mom did this to me. People who bullied did this to me. You're going to always live right there. You have to figure out ways to move forward because you're not coming back. And it starts with the mirror. And I call it the accountability mirror in the book. It's not fair. You're right. It is not fair. The situation that you're in, the people around you, the lack of resources that you have, it is not fair. I agree with you. So now what? because you have a very important choice to make. The past does not have to equal the future. Where you started from does not have to be where you end up. All of your heroes overcame bigger obstacles than what's in front of you right now. So now what? Are you gonna take accountability and create a new life or keep complaining about how your current life is not fair? Let me tell you a quick story about friend of the channel, Alex Sayan, who helps me run Toronto Dance Salsa. Alex was a student at TDS for a number of years and badly wanted to be a helper. Helpers are advanced students who then help volunteer their time to help out the other students. He was rejected. He was rejected over and over and over again that he was not good enough to be a helper. Finally, he got accepted to be a helper. His next step was he wanted to be assistant, then he wanted to be an instructor, and over and over and over again. While people were getting promoted and given opportunities, Alex just didn't have the material. Alex kept getting said, no, 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 no. You're not ready, you have to fix this, you gotta fix that, you're not good enough yet. Keep going home, keep working on it. Eventually he got to the point where Sharon, who is the original owner of the studio, said, okay Alex, I'm gonna train you to be an instructor. Years after where most people would have been given the opportunity, Alex finally earned his way in. It's easy for him to have said, hey, it's not fair. Why are other people getting opportunities ahead of me? Hey, it's not fair on me. But he kept going. He kept working. He kept grinding. Then disaster struck. Finally, he got that opportunity, right? To be trained to be an instructor. And then Sharon, the lead instructor, hurt her back and couldn't train with him. So she asked me to come in and help teach the class. There's a problem though. You can't have two guys at the front of a class. 
I couldn't dance with Alex. That's not traditionally how classes are run. So Alex was defeated. Finally, he had worked so hard to get this opportunity, and then he realized, I'm gonna have to go back to just being on the sidelines, because Emma's gonna come in and teach the class. Now, I didn't think Alex was ready. I had known him for a number of years. I didn't think he was responsible enough. I didn't think he had what it took. But because Sharon had made a deal with him, I decided I would honor that deal. And on the day that he came to pick me up to go to the studio, I said, Alex, we got two options. The class is happening tonight. Either I could run the class and do it and you can sit on the sidelines and watch, or you can run the class and I'll sit on the sidelines and I will guide and mentor you. You get the pick, but you have to decide right now because we're driving the class and we're gonna be there in 15 minutes. What do you want to do? And to my, not just surprise, but also admiration, he said, I wanna do it. He wasn't quite ready to take on the whole class, but he said, I'm gonna do it. And he went up and he did it. Was it amazing? No, but it was momentum. And he kept going. And now, fast forward to today, if you gave me a brand new salsa student and said, this person has to learn salsa and I wanted to have a fun time doing it, I would put money on Alex over anybody in the world to give them the best possible experience. I would, from a guy who I didn't believe would be a good instructor to now being the best in the world. How? Well, he had to overcome all of these things that weren't fair. He had to overcome growing up having super sweaty hands and not being able to touch a girl, so he never learned to dance until he became an adult. He had to overcome years of people passing him by, getting opportunities ahead of him because he wasn't good enough. He had to overcome waiting to get his chance to be trained to be an instructor, and then finally, here it is, it all happens. And it looks like the whole thing is gonna get ripped away from him because the woman who was training him couldn't teach anymore. And then he had one shot, and that's all it takes. You will get your one shot. You will get your one shot. If you keep going, you will get your one shot. If you take accountability, you will get your one shot. What do you do when you get your one shot but you feel like you're not ready yet? Because that's the pivotal moment where you can decide, I'm gonna fall back to the life that I had or I'm gonna step forward into a brave new world that I don't know how it exists yet. And I'm scared and I'm not ready, but I'm gonna take it. But if Alex told himself, it's not fair that all these things have happened to me, he would never have got his one shot. It wouldn't happen. And so I'm gonna give you three ways that you can make Alex's story your story, that you can make every success story, every person you look up to, their success story can be your story using this three-step process. Here we go. Step number one, get clear on what you want. What do you want? Make it super clear. You can't just want a better life. What does that look like? Get super clear on what it is that you are going after. Write it down, one sentence. Make it clear for yourself, make it clear for the people around you, make it clear for anybody who comes in contact with you. Say, hey, what do you want? This, this is what I want. I have absolute focus. And when people look at you and say, you're never gonna do that, look at where you're coming from, that's okay, because you have direction, right? The world gets out of the way for the person who knows what they want. You need to get clear on what you want. Get it down to one sentence. Step number two is study three people who've done it before. Study three people who have done exactly the thing that you wanna do. Look at them. Look at how they started, right? Not how they're winning now, amazing. Started, how did they get started? What were the obstacles they had to overcome? Because chances are they had to overcome a lot of obstacles. And in looking at their stories, it gives you two things. It gives you one, motivation, to see where they came from to where they are now, that's motivation. And two, it gives you tactics, gives you strategies, gives you ideas. You get to learn how they overcame those obstacles, that feeling of it's not fair, that feeling of I don't have the resources to help me go, and then boom, they go off and blow up. If Alex looked at Sharon, who started the school, Sharon started it as an adult. She didn't have dancing growing up. She started as an adult. She was the worst dancer of her friends when she started to learn. She was the worst. One of the first guys to dance with her left her in the middle of a song on the dance floor. For a lot of people, that'd be soul crushing. That would be, it's not fair, it's not fair. I didn't go to school for this. I didn't learn this growing up. I'm trying to learn this as an adult. I don't, I don't have what it takes. It's not fair. It's not fair for that guy to be so mean. It's not fair. Great, she said, you know what? Yeah, it's not fair, but I'm gonna keep going. So study three people who've done exactly the thing that you wanna do, learn from them, get motivated by them, and use their strategies to work for you. 
And step number three is create CEO time. You need to create CEO time. CEO time means you're working on being the CEO of your business and your life. The CEO, that big goal that you set in step number one, that demands a CEO. If you want that goal to happen, you need to step up and be the CEO of architecting that goal into existence. And so you need to have CEO time somewhere in your calendar. You need to pull out your calendar, however you're using it, if it's Google calendars or notebook or whatever you're using. And every week there needs to be a chunk of time, a window of CEO time. And in that time, you're going to be spending your absolute focus on driving that number one goal into fruition, creating it into existence. So when is that going to happen for you? Pull out your calendar and make it happen. If you're only spending half an hour a week on CEO time, well, your goal is going to come to you very slowly. Most of the world wakes up and has zero CEO time. You're just in reaction complaining mode. So half an hour is better than nothing. But can you spend two hours, three hours, four hours, more? CEO time, not reacting to people, not getting distracted, not working on projects that other people want you to work on. Every week, put into your calendar right now, block it off, put gates around it so people don't trample all over your time. You got to protect it because if you're not spending time on CEO time every week, you're not building the life that you want. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're going to enjoy. But before that question of the day, I want to know how will your future look different from your past? Let me know in the comments below. In the 18th century, there was something that spread across Europe and eventually made its way to America called puerperal fever, also known as the black death of childbed. Basically what was happening, is women were giving birth and they would die within 48 hours after giving birth. This black death of childbirth was the ravage of Europe and it got worse and worse and worse over the course of over a century. In some hospitals, it was as high as 70% of women who gave birth who would die as a result of giving birth. But this was the Renaissance. This was the time of empirical data and science, and we had thrown away things like tradition and mysticism. These were men of science. These were doctors. And these doctors and men of science wanted to study and try and find the reason for this black death of childbed, and so they got to work studying, and they would study the corpses uh, of, the, of the women who had died. And in the morning, they would conduct autopsies, and then in the afternoon, they would go and deliver babies and finish their rounds. And it wasn't until somewhere in the mid-1800s that Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, father of Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, realized that all of these doctors who were conducting autopsies in the morning weren't washing their hands before they delivered babies in the afternoon. And he pointed it out and said, guys, you're the problem. And they ignored him and called him crazy for 30 years until finally somebody realized that if they simply washed their hands, it would go away. And that's exactly what happened. When they started sterilizing their instruments and washing their hands, the black death of childbed disappeared. My point is, the lesson here is sometimes you're the problem. We've seen this happen all too recently with our new men of science and empirical uh, studiers and these men of finance who are smarter than the rest of us until the thing collapsed. And they blamed everything else except themselves. And my point is, is take accountability for your actions. You can take all the credit in the world for the things that you do right as long as you also take responsibility for the things you do wrong. It must be a balanced equation. You don't get it one way and not the other. You get to take credit when you also take accountability. This whole life, like one thing I realized is that at certain times in a man's life, he's either a fool, he's a victim, or he's a king. Mm. And when you're a fool, you're like, you goof it all up. You know, oh, well, you know, it, it, but you, you think there are no consequences for your actions, but there are always consequences for every act you do, everything, good or bad. 
But then when you mess your whole life up, being a fool, you become a victim. Mm. Now, oh my God, look, you know what? You know why? You know why I did that? Because I was black. You know what? Because I, I grew I grew up in all that religion. And oh, my father was an alcoholic. You know, he beat my mom. You know that, right? Or uh, look at this, look at the situation. I'm from Flint, Michigan, man. It's hard. It's hard for a black man in this in this society, and this way we did it. I had, and let me tell you, the table is always full of excuses. Mm-hmm. Because they're valid. Yeah. There's a lot of people against you. And you can say, oh my God, this table is full. It's like, man, you know, this is the reason why I'm like this. And this is this, this is, and, and man, you never went out. And you always stay down. Always. You always, and, but the king stage is when you realize, wait a minute, this is your table. Mm. Wait a minute, this is your room. You have to accept whatever you are letting into your life, good or bad. As a king, you can tell people, get out of your court. Mm. As a king, you don't have to accept any of those excuses. Yeah. As a king, you have to know that you are responsible for your life, good and bad. You did that. So as a king, if something's not right, it's your responsibility to change it. If you want another awesome video in our Black Excellence series, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.